Matthew chapter 5. We're going to read from verse 17 down to 20, and then we'll pray, and then we'll get into today's message. The title of the message today is, Unless Your Righteousness. Unless Your Righteousness. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 20, Jesus says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you give us wisdom so that we may enter the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I I almost didn't finish my associate's degree. Now, I've gone on and I've got my master's degree, but I almost didn't finish my associate's degree. I was, I was one semester away. I was going through summer school and I was, I was one semester away from just calling it quits. I, at the heart of this traumatic experience was a six page paper. Anybody, anybody had to do papers in school? You know what I'm talking about? Well, in college, it's like a paper every week. I, I, it was an online class and somehow, some way, I must have pulled the old syllabus and I should have figured Something was wrong when all the links in the paper that the teacher had given were dead. Like most of them didn't work. And I, and I caught that probably around Wednesday. You know, I had started and I was researching. I thought, okay, I'm going to get this done. I'm going to take adva- advantage of my opportunity and I'm going to start my paper early. So I'm researching and I'm starting to write. But I had sent an email to the teacher saying, Hey, I'm having trouble with some of the, the, the resources you've given. Like, can you let me know what's up? Well. I'm researching, didn't hear anything from the teacher. I'm, I'm, I, so I start writing my paper. Matter of fact, it's Friday night. I write my paper and I check my email and guess what the teacher says? Oh, you're on the wrong paper. That's the wrong syllabus. The reason why those links aren't working is because that ain't the assignment. And guess when the assignment was due? The next day. And I was like, oh no. I, I mean, I spent a week researching the wrong topic. I spent a week writing the wrong paper. I had, I, 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 and then not only that, after I read that email, I was frustrated. Anybody been frustrated before? I, I was embarrassed, right? I had done good work on the wrong project. I was stressed because I had a day to research a whole new topic and write a six page paper. I knew what the requirements were, except for I was looking at the wrong requirements. I put in a lot of work, did my best work on the wrong thing. You know, we begun a series on the Sermon of the Mount, and we're going to continue this through the summer, and we're in the second part. And last week, we looked at the topic of Jesus' message, the kingdom of heaven. Did you notice how many times Jesus said the kingdom of heaven just in our three verses alone? The backdrop of this series is the kingdom of heaven. But this week, we're going to look at his thesis, his thesis statement of how we enter the kingdom of heaven. See, when you write a paper, your main idea, your thesis, what you're trying to prove, the the goal of the entire paper is this statement, this thesis statement, this big idea. When you preach a sermon, guess what? There's usually a big idea. Jesus has given us his big idea for the whole Sermon on the Mount. The context is going to heaven. The topic is about entering into heaven, but the, con- the, the thesis, the, the how you get there, the what it looks like, we're going to look at today. And I want to talk to you about the requirements or the standard of entering the kingdom of God. Even beyond that, what does it take to be great in the kingdom? Jesus tells us. Does anybody want to be great? I got three people that want to be great. You want me to switch it? Does anybody want to be least? Okay, no one takes that one. Okay, good. So I'm going to assume we all want to be great, right? Or at least good. We need to get this right, right? Because if we don't get it right, there's eternal ramifications. Think about it. Have you ever watched, a, I was watching on YouTube a, a video of, of the NHL, the hockey league with the wrong team 
mistakes. Have you ever seen those wrong team moments? Just do a search, NHL wrong team moments, and you'll see these hockey players shooting in their own goal. Right? You ever seen kids on a field get confused or a football player go into the wrong end zone? And then everybody's cheering except for the, you know, on the other team. And the guy's like, well, what's going on here? Staring there dumbfounded. Why? Because they scored on their own selves. Do you know if we, if we don't understand the standard of righteousness set by God, mean that what that means for us, that means we could aim for the wrong goal and make it. You could be aiming for the wrong target and the, the tragedy in that is you hit it. If we don't know what we're going for, if we don't know what we're supposed to do, we could actually miss entrance into the kingdom of heaven. This is the topic. This is what Jesus is saying. The thesis statement is, if unless, your, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you won't make it in. His whole purpose of this sermon is to tell you how to make it in. How to live the life that makes it in. But if we don't understand that, if we don't know what that looks like, if we don't know what we're shooting for, then we can... Totally miss and totally not make it. But if we do follow the example and the teaching of Jesus, then we'll know the standard, not only know the standard, but we'll actually be able to live according to that standard so that we can enter into the kingdom. In Proverbs 22, 28, I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. But the Bible says, don't cheat your neighbor by moving the ancient boundary markers set up by previous generations. This idea is an important idea. And this idea actually has significant impact on what Jesus is trying to tell us today. See, there's a growing cultural resistance to, and really movement away from, uh, authority and institution, right? Our generation's in danger of throwing away thousands of years of wisdom and, and combined cross-cultural human experience. Think about this. What are we doing? We're, 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 we're following what historians call or, or, or maybe sociologists call the fallacy of presentism. Does anybody know what that is? The fallacy of presentism. Now it's longer than this definition I'm going to give you, but I'm going to give you the real simple version. It's this. We think that because we're advanced, because we're modern, because we are contemporary, we have advancements in science, advancements in technology, advancements in learning, that we are therefore morally superior to historical generations. That we're better than them because we have an advantage that they don't have. Or we have tapped into things that they don't have access to. As a result, we, we, we think of ourselves as more evolved, we're more progressive, we're more intelligent, we have more money, we have more blessing, we have more stuff, we have more access, we have more than the Neanderthals of 200 years ago. So what we do then is we determine that traditional standards either apply or they don't. We determine which ones need to be changed to fit with modern life or don't. And you know what? This might be new to our kind of culture, but it's not new to the church. There actually was a thing, a doctrine created by a bishop named Marcion or Marcion back like 80, 95 to 145, I believe, somewhere in that time frame where they, they, he created this kind of doctrine that's been called antinomianism. Is it all right if we do a little education this morning, right? We get a little smart. Antinomianism is basically, it really just means against the law. What was his doctrine? His doctrine was this. Because of the grace of God, the law is un unimportant. Conduct doesn't matter. We're saved by faith and faith alone. So whether you sin or don't sin, it don't matter. Grace is here. Whether you live holy or unholy, it don't matter. The grace of God is available. Grace is greater than everything, so therefore nothing else matters when it comes to salvation, when it comes to entering into heaven. In other words, the standard that God gave, the standard that Jesus taught, the standard that the disciples preached, the apostles preached, the standard of Scripture, it don't matter because of grace. I can pick and choose now. I can say, well, that doesn't apply to my life. This doesn't matter to my life. This is... No big deal. Matter of fact, you know what he did? He took the Bible. He took, he took the Bible that the believers had and he said, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you what the real Bible is. And he pulled out the gospel of Luke and said, I believe the gospel of Luke. We'll follow the gospel of Luke. And he said, and 10 of Paul's letters. That's all we're going to have. That's our Bible because of grace. 
So he edited the scripture. Why? Because he thought he knew better. Thomas Jefferson famously did this. You know that in his day, he actually did the first cut and paste. He took a razor and glue and literally cut out portions of the Bible and pasted them on a page into a new manuscript that he called the life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth. It's come to, it's come to be called the Jefferson Bible. Do you know what he did? He removed things that he considered as nonsense or unnecessary. He took out miracles. He took out all kinds of stuff. But he said, this is what you got. This is the real words of Jesus. This is the essence. This is the core. This is all that you need. In the 80s, in 85, a, 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 a group called the Jesus Seminar. This is what they called themselves, the Jesus Seminar. They decided that they were going to edit Scripture according to what they believed were historically accurate statements of Jesus. So you can go online and find out all their edits, how they remove this and remove this. And funny thing is, is they, they appeal to extra biblical texts that were written hundreds of years later that the church rejected as Gnostic texts to derive their conclusion about what actually was in the scripture, what actually isn't it, ignoring the fact that you know that the entire, all of the gospels are written by eyewitnesses, by people that were literally right there during the events of the scripture. This wasn't, this book wasn't given to us hundreds and hundreds of years later. It was within the lifetime of the people who lived and existed during these events. But the Jesus, Jesus seminar said, nah, we don't think they're trustworthy. We have the hindsight of history and we can use computers to analyze language structure and sentence structure. And we're going to approach this very critically and we're going to chop out what we like and chop out what we don't. And you don't have to look very far nowadays. You can go on TikTok or you can go on YouTube and you're going to find people that, that are trying to change Scripture. Clear text on Scripture. On all kinds of things. From, from sexuality, what is God's view on, on the LGBTQ? Is it in Scripture? Yes, it is. But you'll have people saying, well, no, it's not really in there. That's a lie. Or you'll have people saying, no, this is what Jesus meant. No, it's not. It's very clear. And it's been clear over and over and over again from generation to generation. But what do we have? We have people that are saying, no, I want a different standard. Why? Because I know better. I know better. I know what the Bible actually meant, so I'm going to cut and paste the parts that, I, that, that fit with my view, and that's what we'll hold on to. That's what we'll agree. That's the way this works. And you know what? This, this, this developing our own standard gives us a system that allows us to, you know, to, to let our good work supersede our bad ones. Right? We're like, we, we know if we had kind of the scales of justice and here are my bad works. Well, I want to do enough good works that lift this up so that I can get into heaven so I can earn my way into heaven. And so if I can adopt my own standard, that allows me to tip the scale on my behalf. That allows me to enter in on my own terms. You see how, and let's be honest, don't we do that? We'll weigh that in our favor, won't we? We pick the scriptures that fit with our views and fit with our opinion and fit with the way we want things to be, and we'll ignore the ones that don't. Just like, just like when we do, when, when we, we do something wrong to somebody, what do we want? We want grace. But when someone does something wrong to us, what do we want? We want justice. Right? So do you see when we set our own standard, how we tilt grace towards us? And justice towards anyone that's not like us or doesn't agree with us? Why? Because we want to be justified. We want heaven. We want blessing. We want to be good. And this really appeals to us. Why? Because it puts control in our hands. It allows us to give more weight to our intentions than our actions. Right? Anybody ever said, well, I meant, I meant well? No, you didn't. You were mean. You were hateful. Well, I didn't, I didn't mean to, you know, I was, I did this just because I was looking out for me. So you hurt, you justify hurting someone else because you were trying to bless yourself. And that makes it right. You ever, you ever seen that little commercial with the, the little grandmas and they're sitting in the, in the, uh, like in a living room and, and, and grandma A has like pictures of people on her wall and, uh, and uh, the lady's disagreeing with her. And she says, well, I'm taking you off of my wall, off of my friends list. And she pulls her picture off the wall. And, and then the lady's like, that's not how this works. 
That's not how any of this works. Guys, when we allow this idea that because we're modern or because we live in an enlightened age, we are more advanced and more progressive and more involved that we get to set our standard. When we decide against the law and only for grace, what we're doing is we're going contrary to what Jesus taught and contrary to the totality of the teaching of Scripture. And as a result, we create a standard of righteousness that that we say takes us to heaven, which really leads us away from heaven. We receive God's grace God's way. God says, I give you grace, and this is how you get it. And if you don't want it, you don't get it. If you don't take it his way, you don't do it his way, you don't get it. Whose fault is that? God's? No, it's ours. It's ours. There are no shortcuts. There are no back doors into the kingdom of heaven. You can't sidestep the standard of Jesus. I mean, think about it. Do you guys know, I think it was the 1996 Olympics, the USA team, fastest team in the world, four runners running hard as possible, got disqualified from a gold medal. Why? Because one dude stepped on a line. They were arguably the fastest. They were the best team we had put forward. And they ran the race and won the gold medal, except they didn't. Why? Because they didn't meet the standard. You got to stay in your lane. And they stepped on the line. And was disqualified. They were cheering. They were celebrating. Only to find out they didn't make it in. How many of us at the end of our lives are going to be like, oh, I can't wait to get to the pearly gates and leave this nasty world behind. How many of us will stand before the Lord and be disappointed? Because we chose a different standard of living. God said, I, I gave you my word. I gave you my way. I showed you my son. I gave you my example. I gave you my love. I gave you my spirit. I gave you help. And you turned it away and decided you want to do it this way. And now you want in? It's only by walking the path. And that path Jesus said was narrow. And it's only by going through the door that God opens for us that we can enter into the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus came and he demonstrated and he taught us the way to the kingdom of heaven. The Sermon on the Mount is all about how to live, how to approach life, how to renew our minds so that we see things from God's perspective so that in the end of all things, we can enter into heaven. So if we follow him, if we learn his ways, then we'll be where he is, which is in glory in the Father's presence. The Apostle Paul gives us a response that I think is useful, instructive to us, uh, his response to the teaching of Jesus in his letter to the Philippians. So in Philippians chapter 3, which happens to be one of my favorite chapters in all the Bible, start. we'll read just verse 7 down to 11, but I encourage you to go back at the very beginning, just read his whole list of accomplishments and qualifiers, the standards by which he could have based his righteousness on. He talks about being a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He talks about being a Pharisee, a very religious person. He talks about being a Jewish. He talks about being of the right tribe, of the right pedigree, of the right background, of the right people, all the things. And then he says in verse seven, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish now that's a very nice translation that word rubbish could be translated as dung as donkey do as dog poo he says i count all those things as dung as trash as garbage as worthless why that i might may gain christ and be found in him listen to this next part not having my own righteousness which is from the law but that which is through faith in christ the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. In other words, if by any means I may enter the kingdom of heaven. So if we want to attain the resurrection for the dead and enter into the kingdom of heaven, then we also have to receive the righteousness that is by God in Christ through faith. So let's look at this thesis of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount so we can begin to discover the standard that we have to meet. Okay, so if you're taking notes, point number one is going to be accept the authority of Scripture. We need to accept the authority of Scripture. 
In Matthew chapter 5, just look at verse 17 and 18 with me. Jesus says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Till all is fulfilled. In these two verses, we get a clear statement on what Jesus' view of the scripture is. Jesus did not come to destroy the scripture. Matter of fact, that word destroy in the Greek there means to annul, to cancel, to invalidate. He did not come to invalidate what was written before. He didn't come and say, you know what? All, all, you know, all of the Old Testament, you don't need that anymore. You got me. He didn't say all the law of Moses. He didn't say all the prophetic statements, all the writings. You don't need that anymore. You got me. He didn't say that. He said, I didn't come to get rid of this. I didn't come to invalidate this. I didn't come to do away with the word of God. Not, he said, not even one pen stroke, not even one punctuation mark. He said, you look at this and you look at even the dots on the I's and the crosses of the T's. I ain't getting rid of none of it. I'm not editing, editing any of it. It all matters. This is Jesus talking. You would think that if he came to give a new way, he would say, I'm getting rid of the old. But he didn't say that. He held the Old Testament scriptures in the highest esteem as the word of God. In our temptation to change things and to exclude things and to try to hide things that we don't like, instead of interpreting them the correct way, instead of looking them in light of the way that God gave them to us, in our attempts to do that, we're actually doing something that Jesus didn't even do. He didn't come to nullify the Old Testament. He said, I come to fulfill it. Now, that word literally means to fill it up. Interesting, he didn't say, I came to fully obey it. He said, I came to fulfill it. I came to fill it up. I came to complete it. I came to, to, to completely satisfy it. What, it. what it means is he essentially came to embody both the promise and live by the demand of scriptures. The prophecies come to pass in Jesus. The commandments are obeyed by Jesus. So why is this important? Why does he start this off? Remember last week we talked about the characteristics. All the people that you would count on, all the ways that we would think you are not blessed. Jesus said those set you up to be able to receive the grace of God so that you can enter the kingdom. But here he switches from characteristics to now there is something critical that you've got to get. Before I go any further, you've got to get this Word of God. You've got to understand why the scriptures are necessary for the kingdom. And what does it mean for us? Why would Jesus start off his thesis about entering the kingdom with a statement about the Bible? Why? Because the Bible offers us a standard of righteousness. It articulates, it illustrates the kind of person, the kind of lifestyle that's considered right and pleasing before God. That's what righteousness is. It's being right. It's, it's being in right relationship. It's being pleasing, acceptable to God. The scriptures outline for us what kind of behavior is acceptable to God, but not just what kind of behavior, what kind of person, what kind of person. Because as we'll see as we go through this series, that you can have the right behavior and be the wrong person. If we're going to develop the kind of righteousness that enters the kingdom of God, then we have to accept the authority of the scripture. We can't change it. We can't ignore it. We have to accept it, and we have to respect it. So listen, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of reading books. I'm a fan of, of being in touch of what everybody is saying and what philosophy is going on and what atheists say and what Muslims say and all these people say. But I'm telling you right now, if anyone utters a word contrary to the word of God, they're wrong. If anyone tells you there's another way, they're wrong. If anyone tells you that any other behavior is acceptable, contrary to what the Word of God says, they're wrong. And you can get mad at that. You can do with that what you want. But I don't have the authority to change God's Word. You don't have the authority to change God's Word. And no one who says they're a preacher in the name of Jesus has the authority to change Scripture. No one. This matters. Whether you enter the kingdom of heaven or not matters, doesn't it? And what did Jesus bank it on? The word of God. Not my opinion. Not what I hope for. 
Not what I, what I, what I feel like, but what God said. Too many people, and I'm telling you right now, I, I, I watch, I have like, you can look at my, my iPhone, I'll show you if you really want to see it, but I've got like 40 some odd podcasts I'm, su- I'm subscribed to. I listen to sermons, I listen to teaching, I listen to business, I listen to all kinds of stuff. What's common today is for people to grab a verse and share their opinion. If you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, you've got to find the ones that give you the verse. And little opinion. Because guess what? In the big scheme of things, my opinion don't matter nothing. What matters is what God said. Amen? Amen. So you need to know the word of God for yourself. But you got you to gotta understand that this is not something to trifle with. This is not something that's optional. This is not something for you to pick and choose and edit as you will. This is the word of God. And when God says you behave a certain way, guess what you do? You behave that way. If you believe that it's God's word, if you want to enter in the kingdom of heaven. And I kind of have to say that straightforward and point blank and kind of in your face. Why? Because in our touchy-feely society, your, your truth is what you want it to be. But that's not true. That's not accurate. No one in, in historical generations would be like, yeah, your reality is real. <laughs> Punch you in the face and say, well, I didn't hit you. I mean, that, that's nonsense. My reality is that, no, it's not. Your perspective might be that, but reality is reality, and you don't decide that. You don't determine that. The standard's been set, not by you. So then after we accept the authority of Scripture, then we need to aim to apply the Scripture. Point number two, aim to apply the Scripture. I'm trying to keep it in action things, but we're aiming to apply. We, our goal needs to be to apply the Word of God, to not just know it, to not just believe it but to actually do it look at verse 19 jesus said whoever therefore breaks one of these one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven but whoever does and teaches them he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven listen it's critical that we accept the authority of god's word but that in and of itself is not enough jesus then focus on the doing, the applying, the obedience required to keep the scripture. What did he say? He said, whoever does and teaches. Did you catch that? What was first? Does. does. Right? I mean, how many of us have tried to use, uh, uh, you know, we knew what the right thing to do was, but we didn't do it? Right? You could tell somebody what the right thing is. It's kind of like, you know, don't do as I do, just do what I say. Jesus said, that ain't cutting it. That ain't enough. It's what you do matters. Those who break the commandments, and he said, even the least, you know what that word least means? It it also means insignificant. Even the ones that you think, ah, this doesn't really matter. It's not that big of a deal. He said, if you break even the ones you think are insignificant, even the ones that are least, then you'll be least or insignificant in the kingdom of heaven that's sobering anybody want to be insignificant i mean we're told god create we're 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 god's masterpieces right created in christ jesus is jesus for good works you're chosen for a purpose you were created for a purpose which means you are not supposed to be insignificant Your life matters to God. It matters so much that Jesus left heaven to die on the cross to redeem you. You matter. You have significance. But if you break even the least of the commandments in the kingdom of heaven's viewpoint, you are insignificant. But he says if you do them and you teach others to do them, then you'll be called great. Then you'll matter. Then people will put some respect on your name. Notice that our status and our experience in the kingdom is connected with our obedience to and practice of the word of God. Think about it. Your status in heaven, Jesus is connecting to what? If you do it, then you'll be great. If you don't do it, you'll be insignificant. So your status... Spiritual status 
If you're a great person, you don't have to be a preacher. If you're a great person, you don't have to be Billy Graham. If you're a great person, you don't have to be Mother Teresa. If you're a great person, what do you have to do? Keep the word of God. That's how you're great. That's how your name is known in the kingdom of heaven. Your experience of heaven is connected to your obedience to the word of God. He says, if, if you don't do this, you don't enter in. Your experience is not going to be good if you're least in the kingdom. Your experience is not going to be good if you're standing on the outside of the gate saying, I want in. It's kind of like that story that Jesus told about Lazarus. You know, he's standing on, he's standing, the rich man and the, the poor man Lazarus, who was the beggar that was sitting outside of the rich man's gate, and they both die. The rich man is, is standing, and he, call, he sees this great chasm between him and, and uh, Lazarus, and he says, oh, he sees Abraham over there. He says, Abraham, do me a favor. Send Lazarus over with a drip of water because I'm so thirsty. And Abraham's like, you had your blessing in your life, and you chose your way. Lazarus is getting his now. And he said, even if we wanted to, there's a gap between me and you. We can't get to you. Your experience of heaven is determined by how you apply the word of God to your life. So we have to apply the word of God to our lives, don't we? I mean, it's not enough to believe the Bible alone. We have to follow the Bible, allow the Bible to influence and inform our beliefs and behaviors. We have to read the scriptures with the whole purpose of doing what they tell us to do and becoming who they call us to be. James says it in, in this way in James chapter 2, verse 19 through 23. We're going to read it in the message translation. He says, do I hear you professing to believe in one and only God, and only God in the one and only God? But then observe you complacently sitting back as if you had done something wonderful? That's just great. Demons do that. But what good does it do them? Use your heads. Do you suppose for a minute that you can cut faith and works in two and not end up with a corpse on your hands? Wasn't our ancestor Abraham made right with God by works when he placed his son Isaac on the sacrificial altar? Isn't it obvious that faith and works are yoked partners? That faith expresses itself in works? That the works are works of faith? The full meaning of believe in the scripture sentence, Abraham believed God and was set right with God, includes his action. It's a mesh of believing and acting that got Abraham named God's friend. And it's true for Abraham, the father of faith. It's true for us. It's not just that we pray a prayer or say the right things or say the right doctrines or even quote the right scripture verses. If we don't apply it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Do you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? Do you want to be a new person? Then you have to accept the authority of Scripture and you have to aim to apply it. You have to put it to practice in your life because otherwise, without doing it, it doesn't work. I mean, have you ever had somebody, you gave them advice and you told them the steps and then they came back and said, it's not working. And you're like, did you do what I say? Well, no. Well, I sometimes wonder if God is looking at us and he's like, if you just do what I say, you'll find out. And we're like, ah, 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 and God's like, bro, I told you. Red letters? I mean, come on, I can't even stick it out on the page. And we're just like, this, this God thing don't work. Well, you're not doing it. You're not working it. I can read books about working out and not get swole. I have to get on the gym. I have to get hard. I have to push some weight, right? I can buy creatine and I can eat the stuff, but that don't matter. It can sit on my cabinet and be worthless. You wonder why this doesn't work for people because we don't accept the authority of Scripture to the point where we actually do it. We don't believe it enough to apply it. And Jesus said, if you want the kingdom of heaven, this is the way. And then finally, I'm going to wrap this up quick. Attain the promise of Scripture. Point number three, attain the promise of Scripture. In verse 20, this is the key statement. This is the thesis point. This is the big idea. Jesus says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, Jesus makes what people call an antithetical or basically a contrasting statement here. And he does that a lot. He says, well, I tell you this or you've heard this, but I'm going to tell you this. 
I, you, you think it's this way, but I'm going to tell you it's this way. This is what he's doing. He's setting us up. He's trying to express the, the importance of believing and practicing, practicing the scriptures, but then he's pulling out the best example that anyone can think of, the scribes and the Pharisees, and says, unless you do better than these guys, you ain't making it. Now, you've got to understand, you know who the scribes were? They were the professional preachers, the teachers. They were the rabbis. They would sit down and break down the law. They would spend hours and hours and hours meditating, studying. You know who the Pharisees were? The Pharisees were radical believers. Pharisee means separate. They, they separated themselves. They, they distinguished themselves as true followers of God. They, they preached about God. They stood in the corners. They evangelized. They tied even down to the smallest seed in their garden. They took it seriously. They were loud about Jesus, or not about Jesus, but about Yahweh. They were that, that super holy person, you know. They were that best preacher you can put up on the stage. They were Billy Graham. They were Mother Teresa. And Jesus said, unless you do better than these guys, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. What does it exceed? It's greater. It's superior. He says, you got to do better than that or you don't even make it. You don't make the cut. Think about that. They're professionals. You know that they memorized the entire Old Testament? The whole thing. And not only the whole thing, they memorized uh, uh, the, the, what was called the questions. They memorized the commentaries. They would sit back and, and they could quote to you whole passages from memory. And they could break it down what this rabbi said and what this sage said and what this one said. And they did it by heart. They made it their goal to keep all 613 commandments of the law of Moses. And they went to the cra- to extremes. They, matter of fact, they added things. Remember when they got mad at Jesus for, for uh, uh, the way he washed his hands? You know why? Because they, they had, you had, if you came over to a Pharisee's house, this is what you had to do. You had to hold out your hands and they would pour the water down and it would drip down. Because if you wash your hands like this, the, the dirty water would roll back on your hands. That wasn't clean enough. So you got to hold it like this while they dripped it down, and then they wash it off. And if you don't wash your hands that way, you were unclean. You were eating unclean stuff. That ain't in the Bible. But they took what was in the Bible, and they went next level. So they're like, hey, if we, if we don't, you know, if we go this far, we're definitely not breaking the rules. And Jesus says, unless you do better than these guys, you're not making it. So what exceeds legalism? I mean, they were serious. What what exceeds these great efforts to keep the law, this great desire to stand up and show people I'm holy and you should follow God because look at how he's blessing my life and look at how he's using me and this is what the, you know, how do we get better than that? Isn't, isn't it, isn't what's better being the person that just keeps it because they do? I mean, think about it. Do you, do you, Do you think it's better for a person to do the right thing because they're forced to do the right thing or because they want to do the right thing? It's better because this is just what they do is they do the right thing by nature, not because they're afraid or not because there's rules demanding that they do so. The person that has the inwardly, has the right mind and the right motive will also outwardly do the right thing. Think about it. God says he looks at the heart. Man looks at external things, right? But God looks at the heart. Listen to what God says. This is why this is important. Jesus said in, or Jer, uh, in God said in Jeremiah 31, 33, this is God speaking, but this is the covenant that will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Look at Ezekiel 36, 27. God says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you or help you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and you will do them. What is the key? It's not just in the mind, it's in the heart. It's receiving the spirit of God so that you don't only agree with God, but you actually do with God. See, we need the righteousness that comes from God, not our ability, not our strength, not by us trying to keep the standard in our best power and our best way because we've all tried that and we know it don't work. 
Jesus is saying, unless you learn to receive the Spirit of God, unless you learn to receive help from God, unless you receive that new covenant in your heart that doesn't depend on the arm of flesh or your capability or your reserves or your tenacity, when it doesn't depend on you, but it depends wholly on your response to me and partnership with me, then you won't enter the kingdom of God. See, the grace of God working within us through the indwelling Spirit of Christ is what we need so that we don't only just say or know the things that please God, but we want to do them. Philippians 2 says it's something like this, that God would be in you working to will, working to will and to do according to his good pleasure. In other words, he gives you help to want to do the right things and then the ability to actually do the right things so that you can enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's not all on you. It's not all on your perfection. It's not all on you getting it right. It's not only you knowing the assignment. It's not all on you. It's, it's on you being in a position of relationship with him where he is working in you. So then you begin to shift your thinking. When your thinking contradicts the authority of scripture, you submit. When your mindset is, is challenged by what God's word says, you say, okay, I'm going to change my mind. Obviously, I'm wrong. When your behavior doesn't line up with God's expectation, you say, okay, I know what the word of God says, so I've got to make a change, as hard as that might be. But I don't have to do it by myself. I can receive help. I can receive grace. The spirit of God, the Bible says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. The spirit of Christ in you through the Holy Spirit is what enables you to walk in righteousness so that you can enter the kingdom of heaven. This is our goal. This is our aspiration that the righteousness that we have isn't only about doing the right thing, but it's also wanting to do the right thing. In order to get into heaven, we have to accept the authority of Scripture. There's no other standard. There's no other way. Jesus did so. And as his followers, if we say we're Christian, we can do no less. Even when it doesn't make sense to us. And let's be honest, there are things in here that don't make sense to us, right? This book is way more raw than y'all know. If y'all read original Hebrew and read through the book of Ezekiel, you'd be shocked because there's like pornographic elements in there. You'd be like, what? That's in the Bible? Yeah, our modern English has kind of watered that down. But I'm just telling you, there are things in here when, when we talk about annihilation and talking about all these things, we're like, wait, what? Kill a whole people? What? Kick out, kick out mar- you know, wh- wives because they're not Hebrew? Like, what is that, God? We look at things, and we're going to look at things. Jesus is going to give us case studies. The next couple of weeks, he's going to give us six case studies of what that looks like, talking about things like anger and murder, lust and adultery, divorce. He's going to talk about all these things. What do you do when someone does you dirty? He's going to tell us. But we have to not only believe that this is the authority, that this is the word of God, but we actually have to, to try to apply it, to do it if we want to attain its promise, everlasting life, if we want to enter into heaven, this is the standard. This is the requirement that's laid out for us. But when we do this, Jesus said, learn of me and you'll find rest for your soul. He said, take my yoke upon you. You know what yoke is? It was a rabbinical term, meant my teaching. Take my teaching on you. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And when we learn to submit to the authority of scriptures, we come under its yoke, its teaching, we'll discover that we've been doing it wrong. We've been making this way too hard. Jesus made it really easy for us. It's not as complicated as we want it to be, as we make it to be. It really is much more simple. When we do that, we'll find that we're right with God. We'll be, we'll be discovering that we'll be right with people. We'll walk in peace and joy and entrance, as the scripture says in Peter, entrance into the kingdom will be abundantly supplied. As we close, I just want you to pray for a minute and see, you know, ask yourself, where do you stand when it comes to the word of God? Where do you stand when it comes to righteousness in Jesus? Where do you stand when it comes to eternity? I'm going to pray. I'll just ask you to pray for a moment. Ask the Lord, what is he saying to you? Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus that you help us be honest as we look at ourselves in relationship to you and to the standard of heaven. Lord, I pray that you would help us understand the truth. Help us resist 
what trends our culture is promoting. Lord, help us to resist the same plots, plans, and schemes of the enemy throughout the centuries to get us to put aside the authority of Scripture, to aim for another goal. Father, I pray that you'd help us through your Holy Spirit come to the obedience of faith and apply the Word of God so that every one of us might be called great in the kingdom of heaven. That every one of us might by the grace of God enter into heaven through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.